Muslim fealty and national security. This is Abin al Huria, son of freedom. Purpose of this study to answer the following questions. Should national security policy make use of moderate Muslims to reduce impacts of radical Muslims? What is a radical Muslim? What kinds of moderate Muslims are there? What does it mean to be a moderate Muslim? Are there any truly moderate Muslims? Could moderate Muslims be enlisted to form a resistance against radicals? What are the risks to this policy, and, what is, and is this policy even wise? Executive Summary In the process of answering the above questions, it is found that an obedient Muslim will have fealty only to the Ummah, the Muslim nation. The only Muslim who can have good faith fealty to a secular nation is an apostate Muslim. This will have significant implications for national security policy. Point of view of these questions. This discussion presupposes that Islam as a doctrinal system is held fixed and that moderate Muslims are leveraged to bring about the desired policy. Abbreviations, references, RT will refer to Reliance of the Traveler, which is a compendium of Sharia law, and Q will refer to Quran. Countering violent extremism, radical Muslims, moderate Muslims. Etymology of countering violent extremism. In October of 2011, front groups from the Muslim Brotherhood wrote the White House demanding a sanitizing of materials, including training materials, related to Islamic-based terrorism. This letter also called for retraining and purges of undesirable agents, officers, analysts, and policymakers. It was drafted by Farhana Kara, President and Executive Director of Muslim Advocates, and sent to John Brennan, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. Brennan responded by agreeing to implement Obama's Countering Violent Extremism Policy. The Countering Violent Extremism Policy uncouples terrorism from any possible connection to Islamic actors as a matter of perception. It was a blindness forced from above toward the ideological source of terrorism. This policy originated from the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, policy of implementing the Islamic Law of Slander. The Islamic Law of Slander is codified in Sharia law. Here are the references. It prohibits criticism of Islam and of its prophet. It has been adopted by UN Resolution 1618. Therefore, the purge in U.S. government documents embod embodied in the CVE narrative represents a dimified Obama administration. What is a radical Muslim? In the current leftist narrative, a radical Muslim is a Muslim who either takes Islamic doctrines to extreme or has created a doctrinal world within Islamic theology which goes far beyond the canonical texts. In leftist narrative, a radical Muslim is not actually following the canonical texts of Islam. They do not represent the religion of peace. Leftist narrative dominates the universities, the mainstream media, and the government bureaucracies. This narrative is highly misleading. It separates what terrorists do from Islam as an animating doctrine. It is designed to blind the public, policymakers, the military, and law enforcement from seeing that Islam could have had anything to do with terrorism. Its purpose is to prevent the victim from seeing and understanding the enemy. Question. Where did this narrative come from? Answers. 1. From leftist narrative. Here is a reference for you. Uh, actually, two references. And 2. From Muslim Brotherhood influence operators embedded in the Obama administration. And here I give you two references. What is a radical Muslim? Terrorism does not come from just any violent extremist. It usually comes from radical Muslims. But a radical Muslim should be understood as not an aberrant Muslim, but as an obedient Muslim. This can be seen from the following facts. Islamic doctrine teaches that it is the goal of Islam to dominate the world politically. 
you can see the reference on the screen. Islamic doctrine teaches that Islam is a civilization and not just a religion. Islamic doctrine teaches that jihad is kinetic and political warfare designed to force the world to accept Islamic political rule. Islamic doctrine requires every Muslim to have Allah, the Prophet of Islam, and the Ummah as his first allegiance. Islamic doctrine requires that a Muslim support and participate in jihad. Radical as applied to Muslims is usually understood to mean militant. Thus, a radical Muslim will tend to be a militant Muslim. And a militant Muslim is militant because they are obedient to their canonical texts. This cuts across the narrative you will typically hear on the mainstream media. This is because Islamic actors have appropriated the language of political correctness, which comes from the methods and presuppositions of cultural Marxism. This is a topic too big to address here. It should be for another slideshow. What is a moderate Muslim? In what ways could a Muslim be moderate? One, they could be moderate in their adherence to the doctrines of Islam. That is, they may still believe in the canonical texts of Islam, but they have been somewhat westernized in their daily practices. They have the luxury of being backslidden since they are in a western country. Two, or they could be moderate because they are crypto-skeptics. That is, they don't really believe some of the doctrines of Islam anymore, or their belief is half-hearted but they still consider themselves cultural marks of Muslims. Islam is all they know. If challenged by an obedient Muslim, they would reassure the obedient Muslim that they still believe in the Quran and the Sunnah. They may go to mosque frequently or infrequently. They may do five prayers a day or not. They do not necessarily follow all of Sharia law. They may tend to be westernized in some of their attitudes and practices. Some moderate Muslims actually want to escape from the strictures of Sharia law, but do not openly say so. They tend not to be culturally militant in wanting to carry out civilization jihad. They may or may not pay generously to zakat. They will tend not to be politically vocal since they live in a more secular life. They since they live a more secular life. What are moderate Muslims' relationship to radical Muslims? Moderate Muslims play the same role in civilization jihad and the coming kinetic jihad that the non-Nazi Germans played during the 1930s. They may quietly support obedient Muslims. A Gatestone Institute study found that there are about 100,000 British Muslims who sympathize with Muslims who commit terrorist acts. The Gatestone Institute found that 43% of British Muslims would want to implement all or part of Sharia law in the UK. The same report found that only one in three, one of three Muslims uh, in the UK would report known terrorist activities to police if they knew about it. What are moderate Muslims' relationship to radical Muslims? Moderates may hope to that they can fade into the woodwork. That is, some of them hope may hope that they that the obedient Muslims do not notice them. These are Muslims who prefer to be Westerners, but still hang on to vestiges of their Muslim upbringing. They are cultural Muslims. Many of these Muslims came to the West to get away from Sharia law. They enjoy the freedoms of the West. The aggregate data from Western intelligence indicates that 15 to 25 percent of all Muslims want to be Sharia compliant, that is, obedient. This means that 75 to 85 percent of all Muslims are moderate. Only a fraction of the 15 to 25 percent who are obedient are currently terrorists or kinetic jihadis. However, in a civil war, that is, open kinetic jihad, it is likely that nearly all of these Muslims would take up arms. It must also be remembered that the doctrine of taqiyya is always operating in the background. This means that, no matter what Muslims say, their doctrine permits them to deceive as to the, their true relationship and attitudes toward civilization jihad, terrorism, and the coming kinetic jihad. It must also be remembered that although supporting jihad is one of the eight categories of the obligatory zakat, as a percentage of the total it may be much higher. If a Muslim's moderation is open and notorious, 
or if they oppose extremism, and it is known to the obedient community that it is not taqiyya in operation, then that Muslim's apostasy will be noted for future action. If civilization jihad finally becomes full-on kinetic jihad, real moderate Muslims are likely to be liquidated as apostates. You will observe that, after terrorist attacks, representatives of the Muslim community are quick to come on onto the TV news and apologize for the carnage and to uh, reassure the non-Muslim population that the terrorists do not represent the true, peaceful Islam. This is taqiyya in action. And any Muslim that goes to the trouble to appear on TV to make such a statement should be considered to be conducting propaganda jihad. Such a Muslim is trying to appear to be saying, we moderate majority Muslims condemn these attacks. Here's an example of Takiyah after the Manchester attack. This man says, quote, we strongly condemn these attacks, and we strongly condemn any attack that is aimed at innocent people. End quote. Take notice that in his lexicon, innocent means Muslim. Any infidel is in rebellion against Allah. Thus, every infidel is a righteous target of jihad. Therefore, any non-Muslim has it coming. His language is pure taqiyya. People making these statements are signaling to their obedient brothers and to the Ummah that they are making fools of us and they are signaling to crypto-radicals that the kinetic jihad is coming. They are drawing attention away from the fact that the terrorists are animated by Islamic doctrine. They are palming off the terrorism as non-Islamic. They are towing to the leftist narrative. This forces the victims to fruitlessly search for some other explanation for the carnage. Lone wolf attack, workplace violence, rage over colonialism, rage over U.S. military action, or fill in the blank with leftist narrative. So far we have two main categories of moderate Muslims. Westernized Muslims, these are Muslims who emigrated to the West to escape the strictures of Sharia law. These are likely to be cultural Muslims. They will tend not to be militant in civilization jihad. They embrace Western values. Quietly obedient Muslims. These are Muslims who emigrated to the West to bring their Islamic civilization with them. They will be militant in pressing civilization jihad. They reject Western values. What percentage of Muslims in Western countries are each of these? We can consult research studies to determine attitudes of Muslims, and these numbers give an indication of the threat. Then we have quietly obedient Muslims. They are not really moderate. They will engage in civilization jihad as pre-violent type of, type of jihad. They will quietly support terrorism. They will press for the installation of sharia. They will give generously to zakat. When kinetic jihad finally comes, that is civil war, they are likely to take up arms. They will back the radicals. Westernized Muslims are a wild card. Although they came to the West to enjoy its freedoms, they are not likely to be willing to pay the price for that freedom in taking up arms against their brothers. This is because, as Muslims, they belong first to the Ummah, not to their country. They will be torn in their loyalty. They are likely to throw in their lot with the winning side. They cannot be counted on to form a bulwark against the radicals. Terminological clarity. So in place of using radical Muslim, I prefer to use quietly obedient Muslim, to describe a Muslim who is obedient to the Quran and Sunnah, who wants to see Sharia law replace the national constitution of this country of domicile. Militant Muslim, to describe a Muslim who is vocal and who visibly promotes civilization jihad, but is usually only pre-violent, somebody like Anjim Chowdhury. Violent jihadi, to describe Mus a Muslim who has taken up arms to promote Islamic rule, for example, ISIS and terrorists. So in place of using moderate Muslim, I prefer to use westernized Muslim, or syncretized Muslim, or cultural Muslim, or backslidden Muslim. Notice that I have reclassified those moderate Muslims who are obedient to Islamic doctrine as radicals. This is because they are not moderate. They want to overthrow the government. 
The only thing about them that is moderate is that they are not vocal, but their intentions are radical. I am retiring the use of radical moderate distinction because it is overused, lacks clarity, and is actually misleading. Thought question for the Western infidel. Think about the nice Muslim neighbor or friend or co-worker you know. Which kind of Muslim do you think they are? A westernized, syncretized Muslim or a quietly obedient Muslim? How could you tell which type of Muslim they are? The myth of the moderate Muslim counterweight. What will happen to moderate Muslims when kinetic jihad comes? As civilization jihad progresses and becomes more militant, we can expect to see more and more terrorist acts, as we now see in Europe. In this way, we can view jihad as being on a continuum. Pure civilization jihad, then increasing degrees of terrorist acts, to finally full-on kinetic warfare. Westernized Muslims are likely to be quickly identified by obedient Muslims. It is likely that obedient Muslims will intimidate westernized Muslims to go along with their more obedient brothers if they do not want to be liquidated when and if kinetic jihad is successful. For this reason, it is unlikely that westernized Muslims can be counted on to counterbalance obedient Muslims, intimidated as they will be. Let us suppose that there is a civil war. The obedient Muslim says to the moderate Muslim, we saw that you were very westernized in your speech and your lifestyle. Does this mean that you have apostatized? The moderate Muslim can always say, No, brother, I was just engaging in taqiyya while I engaged in civilization jihad behind the scenes. We may never know the actual mind of the moderate Muslim, but because of taqiyya, he can always flip-flop according to the blowing wind to save his own skin. In this way, we can see that the moderate Muslim cannot be counted on to protect the nation from civilization jihad and an eventual kinetic jihad, meaning a civil war. In this way, the moderate Muslim just functions as ballast and not as a counterbalance. He is along for the ride. Any Muslim to be a true Muslim must have as his first political loyalty to the Ummah, the Islamic Empire. This is Islamic doctrine. Any Muslim who has, as his first who has as his first political loyalty to the constitution and laws of a secular state and holds his Islamic loyalty only at, at a religious level is not an obedient Muslim. This is because Islam is a nation, a civilization, and not merely a religion. This is because Islamic doctrine teaches that every Muslim must follow Sharia law and Sharia law automatically abrogates secular laws and constitutions and will replace them at the end of jihad. This means that to ask the question, could we leverage moderate Muslims to be a bulwark against radical Muslims, is tantamount to asking, is it, real, is, is it a realistic policy alternative to engineer as the typical Muslim, one who is willing to renounce Sharia law, renounce jihad, and renounce giving, to, giving money to uh, zakat as, as, since part of jihad goes to finance jihad? Can moderate Muslims be used as a counterweight to obedient Muslims? The short answer is no. When moderate Muslims come on, the, on news broadcasts immediately after a bombing to apologize for the carnage and to distance themselves from the perpetrators, they are practicing taqiyya. If a moderate Muslim were to openly and sincerely oppose obedient Muslims in a public space, the obedient Muslim will communicate with each other that the moderate is actually an apostate to be killed later when opportunity arises. If a moderate Muslim is giving to zakat, they are supporting the ummah, their nation. When they are financially supporting jihad, then they are financially supporting jihad. Then they are not moderate at all. Can there be such a thing as a benign moderate Muslim? To be considered benign, a Muslim would have to be would have to first renounce their obligatory payments to zakat. A truly benign Muslim would have to renounce the legitimacy legitimacy of jihad, all forms of jihad, kinetic and civilizational, and in, in all of its forms. But jihad is an obligation in the Islamic sources. Any Muslim who renounces jihad is considered an apostate. 
A truly benign Muslim would have to renounce Sharia law and accept a secular state of residence. And a truly benign Muslim would have to renounce taqiyya. But the problem with taqiyya is that you can never be sure. Taqiyya poisons the well. No Muslim can renounce Sharia law and call himself a Muslim. Sharia law is not severable. To be truly benign, a Muslim would have to renounce the implementation of Sharia law as the goal of the Islamic Ummah. But because Islam is a legal doctrine as well as a religious doctrine, to renounce Sharia law sincerely and not as taqiyya would be tantamount to renouncing Islam in the eyes of the obedient Muslims. This is because the Muslim is obligated to promote Allah's lordship over the earth. Islamic theology does not allow the legitimacy of secular government. Secular government is considered a usurper in Islamic theology. The only real moderate Muslims are apostate Muslims. The only moderate Muslims who are not a threat to our national security are Muslims who would be considered apostates by obedient Muslims. But such moderate Muslims might as well take the final step of publicly renouncing Islam. Because Islam has, as its goal, to rule the earth politically by a force of arms, the only Muslim who is not a national security threat is a cultural Muslim who would not be considered an, who would be considered an apostate by the Ummah. Therefore, it would not be an unreasonable policy to reclassify Islam in law as a political ideology which uses religious language and to deport any Muslim who will not renounce Islam. At first glance, this may seem like an extreme policy. Why is it reasonable? In Islamic theology, the Muslim has as their first political allegiance to the Ummah, not to the country of domicile. This is the reason why we are seeing the emergence of no-go zones. A no-go zone is an area where Islamic ideology has cultural dominance. Islamic norms dominate to such an extent that non-Muslims no longer feel safe in those zones. Police, firefighters, and emergency medical technicians do not feel safe in no-go zones and generally must enter en masse. No-go zones are, in effect, zones where the sovereignty of a country has been handed over to the Ummah. The existence of no-go zones demonstrates that Islam is an empire, not a mere religion. The religion is just the language. A Muslim cannot be a loyal citizen to a secular state. In order to be certain that a Muslim is loyal, is a loyal patriot to the country of domicile, they would have to declare and show that they have renounced any political loyalty to the Ummah. A part of the naturalization process is for the applicant to declare loyalty or fealty to the new country. If a Muslim were to do this sincerely, he would be declaring that he is a traitor to the Islamic Ummah. This is because Islam is a nation. This is the meaning of Ummah. When a Muslim is naturalized, he is either committing taqiyya or apostatizing. Let me say this again. It's very important. When a Muslim is naturalized, he is either committing taqiyya or apostatizing. So when a Muslim de declares fealty to a non-Islamic country in the process of naturalization, he is either apostatizing or committing taqiyya and lying under oath. But since migration is a type of jihad, the Ummah understands that he is lying under oath. Recall that Muhammad said, war is deceit, and that Muhammad is considered the perfect example of human conduct in Islamic theology. Given that Islam is a nation, a civilization, and not a mere religion, it is therefore reasonable to require a Muslim to renounce Islam to naturalize. How can a Muslim not be a security threat? To not be a, secu a national security threat, a, mo a moderate Muslim would have to renounce Sharia law in any hope of implementing it, declare loyalty to the constitution and laws of the country of domicile, and that they would never try to overthrow them, renounce jihad, kinetic and civilizational, and demonstrate such renunciation by refra reframing from pushing the implementation of Sharia regulations, agree to not give any money to Sakat. How can a Muslim not be a security threat? In other words, the Muslim agrees to practice Islam only as a private faith. 
But because Islam historically and doctrinally has functioned as an empire and a civilization, it is not possible that such a commitment could be carried out. There are prohibitive doctrinal problems with thinking that Islam could be transformed into a private religion only. I will try to address this in another slideshow. Even if Islam is practiced as a private faith, there is still the problem of taqiyya. There are several problems with this policy. How could you verify that Muslims are not secretly giving to the zakat and jihad? And zakat and therefore jihad, I should say. Since people are guaranteed freedom of assembly in the U.S. Constitution, how could you be sure that Muslims are not conspiring in mosques, madrasas, in small groups, or online to wage civilization or kinetic jihad? Because of the doctrine of taqiyya, you could never be sure that any promises made by a Muslim are in good faith after their perfect example of Muhammad. Muhammad taught that taqiyya is acceptable, that war is deceit, and he broke his treaties. Is it reasonable to expect Muslims to agree to practice Islam only as a private faith? So even if Muslims agreed to practice their doctrine as a private faith, there is still a risk coming from the doctrine of taqiyya. Given the present doctrinal structure of Islam as that of a civilization, political, legal, cultural, as well as religious, it is not reasonable to expect Muslims to practice a gutted version of their faith. Even if they were to agree to do so, given the doctrine of taqiyya, it is likely that Muslims would just push kinetic jihad further into the future and concentrate on jihad of the womb in the present as in Europe. Because Muslims have as their first political loyalty to the Ummah, they are not likely to express the kind of devotion and loyalty to the receiving country desired and needed to protect the integrity of that country. They are more likely to just be going along for the ride. If a Muslim says, I renounce any future Sharia law in this country, I renounce jihad, I renounce zakat, and I declare this country as my first political loyalty, and if they are sincere, then they are apostates. Then why would such Muslims not just finally renounce Islam entirely? Therefore, if a Muslim is not willing to renounce Islam, they still pose a national security risk. Why? Because any obedient Muslim first belongs to the Islamic civilization or nation, a political entity. I want to say that they first belong to the nation of Islam, but the phrase nation of Islam has already been hijacked by black Muslims. If this discussion seems cryptic to you, it is that you are still thinking of Islam as a mere religion, which it is not. So how are we to view true moderate Muslims? Any Muslim who is truly moderate and who poses no national security risk would be considered an apostate by the Ummah. For now, I will just assert that it is highly unlikely that we can engineer a version of Islam that is apolitical. I will try to address this in the future. Therefore, we must find ways either to convert residents away from Islam, that is, uh, residents in this country from away from Islam, or find a way to de deport them. Now I know what you are thinking, that this violates freedom of religion. But again, that is because you are thinking Islam is only a religion, which it is not. In simplest terms, because Islam is a nation and a civilization and not a mere religion, because a Muslim has as his first loyalty to the Ummah, because he supports jihad, warfare, by the Ummah through zakat, because he is under obligation to wage jihad, kinetic and civilization, he cannot finally be loyal to any secular state. Therefore, any obedient Muslim is a national security risk. Policy toward Muslim citizens and residents. So what should be the policy toward moderate Muslims? The best and safest policy toward truly moderate Muslims is to try to help them find, take that final step of renouncing Islam. Help them to see that, is, that Muhammad was a false prophet. Help them to see that the Quran is just a compilation from other sources when it is not a fabrication by Muhammad. In this way, you will be helping to weaken the Islamic Empire and making your country safe for liberal democracy and what Popper, not Soros, calls the open society. 
If you love freedom and liberal values, you will invest the energy to be able to refute Islam to a Muslim and to free them from their bondage. If at this point you are saying to me, how can you be so hateful toward one of the world's great religions? My answer to you is that you are unable to face the facts I am presenting to you. So what should be policy toward moderate Muslim refugees? First, most refugees are not refugees. They are merely migrants. Secondly, because Islam is a civilization and because of taqiyya, it is reasonable to borrow Muslims from immigration. The only Muslims who should possibly be allowed to enter the country are Muslims who can demonstrate that they have renounced Islam. That is, they are apostate Muslims, and therefore under a death threat in their country of origin. If at a later time they become reverts, they should be deported. Okay, case one. We have a Muslim who is not yet a citizen. He calls himself a moderate, but says he wants to see Sharia law implemented, and he gives to zakat. This is an obedient Muslim. Deport him. He will support civilization jihad. He will support violent jihad, civil war later. He is not a, a moderate. He's a national security risk. Case 2. He's not yet a citizen. Calls himself a moderate. Says he does not want Sharia law. Says he does not give the zakat. This may be a westernized Muslim. Ask him to sign an affidavit declaring his apostasy from Islam publicly. If he refuses, deport him. This is because, if he still wants to be a Muslim, he is loyal to his prophet and to the Ummah. These are his first loyalties. He is likely practicing taqiyya. Case 3. Okay, here we have a Muslim who is a citizen. He calls himself a moderate, but says he wants to see, shir and, uh, he wants to see Sharia law implemented, and he does give the zakat. This is an obedient Muslim. He may be militant or quiet. He is a definite national security threat. Revise sedition laws to outlaw both violent and nonviolent advocacy for the overthrow of the Constitution and laws of the country. Uh, at present, the sedition laws are written uh, to prosecute you only if you are advocating violent overthrow of the government. I'm suggesting that they should be made stronger uh, to specify also nonviolent advocacy for the overthrow of the uh, Constitution. Prosecute any acts of sedition as defined above, and in the meantime, try to convert them away from Islam. Case 4. Here we have a citizen. He calls himself a moderate, says he does not want Sharia law, says he does not give the zakat. This may be a westernized Muslim, or he may be practicing taqiyya. Observe whether he is politically an activist for civilization, jihad. Observe whether he advocates the replacement of the Constitution with Sharia law. Uh, if he does, then prosecute him. In the meantime, try to convert him away from Islam. So here's a summarized Muslim policy. One, if a Muslim who is not yet a citizen is not willing to renounce Islam as a condition of residence in the country, deport him. This is because he can never give full fealty to the country. 2a. If a Muslim who is a citizen is not willing to renounce Islam, then if he is observed advocating for replacing the Constitution with Sharia law, prosecute him under, uh, under enhanced sedition laws. 2b. If a Muslim who is a citizen gives to zakat, prosecute him for material support of terrorism, since part of zakat goes to support Jihad, which is terrorism. Even if it's not in this part of the world, it might be in another part of the world. 2C. If a Muslim who is a citizen advocates for jihad, violent acts, prosecute him more vigorously under existing anti-terror laws. 2D. Any naturalized Muslim, think about this. Few people discuss this. Any naturalized Muslim who is not willing to renounce Islam could technically be prosecuted for perjury because when he said he gives full allegiance to the country, he perjured himself. Technically, you could revoke his citizenship. And to drive that point home, I'm going to read to you the oath of allegiance to the United States <clears throat> when you uh, become naturalized. Quote, I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom 
or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform work of national importance under, under civilian direction when required by the law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God." Unquote. No obedient Muslim can honestly swear this oath for the reasons I have given in this presentation. This has enormous policy implications. Think about that. Those of you who are in the national security community, you have not considered this fully and need to think through how that should impact future laws to protect this country. All right, thank you for listening, uh, and I'll look forward to talking with you some more.